of you may remember it, it used to be called the Humanities Week. Uh, so it was over a week, but it, uh, you know, it grew into a full month now of uh, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of events, uh, community outreach, engagement, and as you will see today, incredible uh, speakers uh, for every October, uh, which marks, by the way, the National Arts and Humanities Month. That's why we have it in uh, in, in October. So the, this year, the theme for the festival is uh, storytelling. Every year we come up with a, with a new theme. We, we kind of uh, ask the faculty and the staff in the college to send some suggestions, and then we get together and 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 and, and make a, a decision, a choice on one of the one of the, the themes. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors who helped to make tonight's event and the festival possi possible: uh, the Dorrance Foundation, Arizona Humanities the Humanities Seminars Program, and Bookman's Entertainment Exchange. So thank you very much um, for their support. We are excited to offer tonight's presentation to a wide audience at home through live stream and captioning provided by the town of Oro Valley, which is uh, another of our partners. So I want to thank them as well for their participation and, and, and support. And uh, I would now uh, like to uh, welcome uh, Karen Francis Beguet, who will be introducing our speakers uh, tonight. Uh, Karen was born and raised on the Navarro Nation. She's of the uh, Taba clan, Age of Water, born for the Kiyani clan, Towering House. She's assistant vice provost of Native American initiatives at the University of Arizona. She leads and coordinates programming in collaboration with academic units and colleges to support Native American students and faculty. She has served on many national and regional boards to advocate for educational opportunities for Native American students and for women of color. Karen has a Bachelor of Science degree in Public Administration and a Master of Arts degree in American Indian Studies and is a PhD candidate in higher education at the University of Arizona. Uh, please welcome Karen and thank you so much uh, for being here with us. So thank you. Um, good evening. I want to just um, also extend my heartfelt gratitude to everyone who has organized this wonderful event, the 2021 Humanities Festival. Um, I was really struck by the theme um, storytelling. I think it's something that we all can resonate with um, in our hearts, um, in our communities, and amongst our families. Um, as Adine introduced me, um, I grew up on the Navajo Nation. I'm a citizen of the Navajo Nation. And I actually vividly recall stories my grandparents and parents shared with us. Um, these stories were about land, culture, um, sometimes even animals. Um, often about their travels, and always about our relatives. The stories were also about their childhood. And something I wanted to share with you is that I recall stories that my 98-year-old paternal grandmother told me of really liking school. Now, I remember um, even stories that weren't so pleasant of my parents and my grandparents attending federal boarding schools. But my grandmother was different. She really wanted an education. And she finished her schooling up to the eighth grade at Santa Fe Indian School. And then she had to leave because her parents agreed to an arranged marriage. This is a story of determination disappointment, but also love. So stories are an important part of who we are. They make deep impressions if you allow them, and they stay with you so you can pass them down generation to generation. So tonight's event will begin with a blessing from Miguel Flores Jr., followed by Life and Stories with Writing Bear, Mike Lindsay. 
At the end, we will also close with a blessing. So I hope you can stay with us. Miguel Flores Jr. is the CEO and President at Holistic Wellness Counseling and Consultant Services. He is affiliated with both the Pascoyaki and Banatham tribes. Miguel is also an artist and healer. For over 28 years, he has provided spiritual leadership and traditional medicine to different tribal communities throughout Southern Arizona. I've known Miguel through his countless contributions to various departments across campus, such as the Native American Research and Training Center under Family and Community Medicine, the Native American Cancer Partnership Program under Arizona Cancer Center, and the Native American Student Affairs Unit, which falls under diversity and inclusion. Miguel has provided spiritual support and cultural trainings across campus, and we are ever so grateful. I am now pleased to introduce Mike Lindsay. We should all be grateful to be here tonight to hear from Mike, whose grandmother influenced his talent for storytelling. I am very fond of Mike's wife, Dr. Marty Lindsay, who is here with him tonight. Marty's retired from the University of Arizona after many, many years of service to advancing opportunities for Native American students and communities. Marty, we are grateful for your unwavering support and commitment. I also know Mike and Marty's daughter, Erica, who I know they are very proud of. Erica is now a physician and was one of my former students who also left her selfless mark on the university, providing peer support to students who were having a tough time adjusting to college. Erica is now a practicing physician in Gallup, New Mexico. So Writing Bear is Mike's spiritual name, used for ceremony, prayer, and storytelling. With Cherokee heritage on both sides, he credits his maternal grandmother, herself a storyteller, with the greatest influence on his life and stories. So I know what you're speaking of. Grandmothers are special. He works in the moment, guided by inspiration and sensitive to his audience. Seven years after his grandmother's passing while recovering from a chronic illness after graduate school, Mike began to have visions and dreams which reawakened the values and stories instilled by his grandmother. Mike has two novels in the works. The first, whose working title is Kamikaze Killers, and it's a mystery set in Japan in the late 1970s. The other is called Rezzed Out. I love that title. <laughs> And it is inspired by his experiences traveling, living, and working in Indian country. He has produced a CD of his stories titled, Stealing Horses. Mike, we look forward to hearing from you. But first, let's please welcome Miguel Flores Jr., who will conduct our blessing. Los Amchaniabo, Kachamalea, Kokstash. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Again, let me introduce myself traditionally. My name is Miguel Flores Jr. I'm a member of the Pasco Yaki tribe in Tanana Atan Nation. My parents are Miguel D. Flores or Salim Mendoza Flores. My paternal grandparents are the late Juan Mendoza, Amelia Mendoza from the old Pasco community. My paternal grandparents are the late Felix Flores from the Barrio Libre Yaki community and Defina Flores from Santa Vera District. And these are my relations. And again, welcome everyone here this evening for this great event. Um, if we can please go outside and stand in a circle while I offer a blessing and a smudging, that would be great. Thank you.
How many of you have ever participated in a ceremony before, smudging ceremony? Anybody? A couple of you? A few of you? Okay. So let me explain before I start for you know what I'm doing. What I'm going to do, I'm going to do a prayer of the four directions. Start off with the east, the south, the west, the north. And what this prayer represents is our, our prayers, this medicine that I have in here with sage, lavender, copal, tobacco. And the, the smoke represents our prayers going up to creator, our higher power, whatever we, we call him or her. And once I get done with the four directions, I'm going to go around in a circle and blow the smoke on you. And this represents taking away any impurities, any toxins that you might have, any prayers that you might need to ask from Creator that hears, hears, hears those prayers. And so this is what this um, represents in the quick notes version of it. Senorita Macha Ata, we come in so manner honor you, sacred small father. We thank you for this day of life, which was punished, Father. We thank you for the morning choke, the morning star, Father. We thank you for the light that, that you give, Grandfather. We thank you for your warmth, Grandfather. We thank you for these relatives gathered here this evening, Grandfather. We come to some manner honor you, the sacred smoke of the sun, Chocolate Macha Ata. Senorita Macha Ata. We come to some manner honor you, sacred smoke, Father. Thank you for the elements of the self, Father. We thank you for the warm rains which are being away, Father. For the rains that bring life, the rains that bring growth, the rains that clean us and heal us. We thank you for our inner peace, our inner calmness, our inner child, Father. We come to some manner honor you, the sacred smoke. Bless them. Senorita Macha Ata'a. We come to some manner honor you, sacred smoke, Father. Thank you for the elements of the Western, Father. We thank you for those ancestors that passed on before us, my Father. We ask them to give us their strength, their guidance, their wisdom, their courage. We thank you for Mother Moon, Grandfather. We come to some kind of honor with the sacred smoke. Bless them. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. We come to some manner on you, sacred smoke, Father. Thank you for the elements of the Lord, Father. We thank you for the cold winds which are being awake, Father. We thank you for the fights and all, Father. We thank you for the endurance which you have to teach us, Father. We thank you for the lessons of life and death which you teach, whether it's death or your birth. Grandfather, you ask that help us spiritually, physically, and mentally. Take away any impurities, any toxins that will lie within us. We ask that the best of the top of our heads, above our feet, to have good, strong minds, good, strong hearts, Father. We ask prayers for all people, all nations, Grandfather, at this time, Grandfather. Grandfather, you know what's in our hearts and those things that, that we might need prayers for, Grandfather, that you may be able to answer these, these prayers, Grandfather. Grandfather, we ask to bless our, our, our speaker, Grandfather, too, bless my brother for Grandfather, for the stories you're going to tell, Grandfather, for the teachings, Grandfather. We come to some manner on the sacred smoke, bless them, Chukotikita Machata.
so many things, so many people to be thankful for. Our hosts on this land, the Tohono, Atham, and Yaki, Pasquayaki people. The Humanities Department for inviting me to do this. To my former boss, Suzanne Panferov, for um, recommending me. And also for <clears throat> all those years of giving me release time to go all these different places and do storytelling. Very generous. And special thanks to Beth Soliard, who I've worked closely with and who has been uh, just incredible. Bookmans for carrying my CD. <laughs> so if you can't get them tonight, there's a, they have a few too. And, and for my brothers and sisters in the worldwide Baha'i community, who've supported me on this journey. Some of you are here tonight. I'd like to thank my uh, stepfather, Frank Lindsay, for being a true father and helping me learn how to be a man. I'd like to thank uh, my Uncle Bobby for being like a big brother. I'd like to thank my mother, my mom, for always being proud of me. And to both of them, my uncle and my mom, for surviving years of unspeakable trauma in an orphanage during their early childhood. And of course, as others have mentioned to my grandmother, for sharing the stories and making sure I knew who I was. Let's jump in with a traditional story. This is a Cherokee story called Rabbit and Bear. It was a beautiful day and Rabbit was walking along and he saw his good buddy Bear. Hey Bear, how you doing? Well, I'm doing good, Rabbit, how are you? I, I'm doing great. Well, you look great. Hey, Rabbit, why don't you come over to my house tomorrow for dinner? We'll share a nice meal. Well, <laughs> that's very nice of you, thank you, I'd love to do that. So the next day, Rabbit showed up at Bear's place, and Bear had a big pot of beans on an open fire cooking. That smells great. Wow, Bear, you, you, you must be a pretty good cook. Well, well thank you, Rabbit. Yeah, and, and it's almost done. Oh, good, because I'm hungry. Yeah, it just needs one more thing. It's not what you think. <laughs> Bear took out a big old knife and he stood over the pot and he took that knife and he sliced into his bear fat, not unlike this. And this bear grease came out and it went into the pot. And then he took his hand, you know, because Bear has the, has the healing medicine. He took his paw and he closed that back up, mixed it back in there. Now it was perfect. Rabbit couldn't get over it. It was so good. This is the best meal I've ever had. I, I just, I'm going to have to invite you next week to my place. Oh, that would be very nice, Rabbit. So sure enough, the following week, Bear shows up at Rabbit's place. Rabbit has a big old pot of beans going on an open fire. And he, uh, he says, uh, it, 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 it's almost ready. Just, just, just needs one more thing. And he pulled out a big old knife and he took it and he put it in his side and blood and, and, and water and everything came out and he was down on the ground. And, and Bear, before he could realize it, 
rabbit was bleeding out, so he took that paw and he closed that up. And he got him up and he got his friend up and he said, what is wrong with you? He said, whoa, what do you mean? He said, why did you do that? I tell you, do it. It worked for you. Oh, rabbit. This is what happens when we compare ourselves to other people. Everyone has their own special gifts and talents. And when we try to compare ourselves to our insides, to someone else's outsides, this is the kind of thing that happens. And then Bear said, and Rabbit, I have seen enough of your insides. I don't want to see any more. <laughs> so that's what we do. That's how we teach our children. And some of the stories are longer. They're more complex. I remember my grandmother would, uh, I would do something bad. And uh, like one time I tried to, well, I didn't try, but I almost burned down a tree. I wasn't trying to burn down a tree. I just wanted to, to make fire because it was fascinating to me. Four years old. She was taking a nap, you know, matches. You know. <laughs> anyway, so she caught me. She put out the fire. And I was so scared. I said, are you going to spank me? She says, no, come here. Sit down. And she told me a story. I don't remember what it was now. But it had animals and things, and all these things happened. And, you know. and so she finished, and she says, OK, do you understand? I said, are you going to spank me now? <laughs> she says, listen. She told me the story again, same story. And then the bear and the animals. And, stuff. and she says, do you understand? You're not going to spank me? <laughs> <laughs> she says, think about it. And I was thinking, I didn't say it, but I was thinking, I wish you'd just spank me and get it over with, you know? <laughs> But anyway, so, you know, I'm, I'm, going, I'm walking around the house for a week, like, you know, am I the, am I the deer? Am I the bear? Am I the snake? Well, you know, what's going on? But this is it. So, the title, A Life in Stories, Visions and Journeys in the Land of Mystery. I work, you know, by inspiration. So I, when I started praying about what to do for you guys tonight, the, the story, the title, this title is going to be my, my inspiration, my guide. So let's see how I can do. This is going to be a little different than what I usually do. It's going to be kind of personal. And I'm going to give you some inside, maybe, to the life of a storyteller and what I've learned with that. So how will I do that? I, I'm going to give you some touchstones, a sampling of things that have happened to me and how that influenced my growth as a storyteller and as a person and as a, as a healer. Because it was after a while I found out that in the Cherokee way, uh, storytelling is a kind of healing. And that made sense. Because at the end of her, her life, my grandmother, she worked as a, I forget what they call it. I think they call it a companion or something like that in, with people who were sick in the hospital. And they would always ask for her again, you know, when they were re, people were put back in the hospital because she'd just tell them stories all day. And then they said, you know, I didn't need the pain medication. I didn't need, I, I forgot about all that. As for the mystery part, we'll see how far we get with that. I don't have that much time. <laughs> but we'll see about the land of mystery. I will tell you this, the land of mystery is, is the land where we're on, where this is it, North America. That's what we're talking about. 
Okay, so how did my storytelling awaken? This was after my, my uh, grandmother had passed. Karen Francis Begay mentioned the visions and so forth. And through that, I became part of a monthly Native American ceremonial circle in Tampa Bay area. And so I was at one of those meetings and they, they were usually two parts. There was, there was a first part of the ceremony around a fire outdoors. And then uh, there would be an intermission. And the leader of the ceremony, he would always say, you know, this, at, at this time, if there are any announcements, if there's any fundraising, if there's any stories, anyone else. And nobody would ever tell any stories, which I always thought was interesting. So one time I was helping out and I was actually tending the fire and I was sitting right next to the fire and I'm looking in the fire. And so when he started saying this, all of a sudden I, I, I was looking in the fire and then I, I closed my eyes for a second and I saw myself walking around the fire counterclockwise telling a story, telling one of the stories I knew from my grandmother. So I thought, that's interesting. So he says, now at this time, if there's any of the stories, and I, said, I have a story. So I stood up and I enacted what I saw. I walked around the circle counterclockwise. I later found out that's the way Cherokees do ceremony. One of the, one of the few uh, groups that do that direction. Anyway, told the story, sat down. Had the second part of the ceremony. Afterwards, a lot of people came out. Wow, that was cool. Are you going to do it again next month? So the time for the next one came the next month. And I said, well, you know, I don't know how to do this. So I said, well, how did it come to me the first time? It came by inspiration, so I better pray. <laughs> so I prayed. And, and basically, for me, that was just a question. Like, hey, any stories? <laughs> what do you want me to do? I don't know what I'm doing. And sure enough, well, prayed, meditated, which is listening. Sure enough, I can't remember. One or two stories came, went to the thing, did what I was Told to do, hey, that was great. You're going to do another one? We'll see. <laughs> so after a while, I became the regular storyteller for this, this event. And this event was open to all people, and it, it grew. It was very, very cool. I, I remember one night, I don't know why, people get interested in November. They get interested in Native Americans. <laughs> so one no, in the, the November one, I remember we had like 300, 400 people. And, and I looked around, and there was the four colors in the four directions. You know, there was people from, from every part of the world there, you know. And, uh, well, anyway, so these people would come, and then from that, they'd hear the stories, and then they would come and talk to me after and say, hey, we have a thing. Will you come over here? I, sure, I guess. So I would be invited by others. Well, what would I do? When I was, I would, I would have to trust that the Creator would give me something, right? I'd pray, listen, meditate, and do it. It was not in my control. Now, there's not many people that in my life right now, except for my wife, who knew me the way I was then. But I did not like to not be in control. <laughs> <laughs> that was not something I sought. So this was a new experience for me. And the people would invite me. They'd say, okay. i say, yeah, I'll do it. And they say, okay. i say, how much time do you give me? And they say, okay, we'll give you half an hour. Water. they say, uh, how many stories are you going to tell? I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. Well, see, I, I, I go by inspiration. and I, Yeah, okay. What kind of stories are you going to tell? I don't know. You know. And so some people could understand it. Some people could get with it. Some people couldn't. I had so, some people, they just get, couldn't, they couldn't deal with it. And I'd, and, I'd, and I'd say, you know, hey, I'm sorry. I can't do it. I can't do it for you because I don't know. 
And I didn't really have a good way of explaining it. You know, I was kind of groping around because it wasn't something I was used to or really even comfortable with, as I've said. So anyway, one time, my wife Marty and I went to a Carlos Nekai con uh, concert in Tampa. Wonderful Navajo uh, flute player, just fantastic musician. And he stood up before the concert started and he said, I got it, I've got the quote right here because it is burning away. There's no agenda to, for tonight. I work in the moment. And I'm like, that's it. I turned him around, that's it. Now I don't have to make this big, long explanation to people. I'm stealing that. So I stole that. <laughs> Thank you, Carlos. I work in the moment. Now, you know, it sounds pretty easy, right? You just ask, listen, and do it. Yeah. Well, and it seemed so for a while, but my, my trust in the Creator was tested, of course. So I got kept getting invited to bigger and bigger things, bigger and bigger things. Finally, there was this Indian Summer Days Festival in St. Petersburg, Florida. The St. Petersburg Historical Museum had this, and it was outdoors. It was in the, in the fall. It was kind of nice and cool, and it was a big deal, a lot of people. And so I'm like, oh, you know, hit the big time here. And so I show up to my venue, and they've got a stage, like it's built up, it's outdoors, but they've got a stage, and I walk up the stage, there's a podium, and I look out, and there's these rows of chairs, there's 400 people coming to hear what I have to say. Well, here's the thing, I had been praying like for the week or two before, nothing. Like nothing, and you just, I, you know, and I was like, well, should I just tell one of them? No, you can't do that. Because you, I don't know who's here. I don't know what they need to hear. So I stood there, silent, kind of the way it started tonight, but I have something to worry. Uh, <laughs> and I stood there, and I'm looking at the sea of people. And I'm thinking, okay, creator, it'd be nice anytime now. And then nothing. And I'm standing there, and they're, they're all quiet. And they're, you know, you can get a lot of attention sometimes. You just shut up. You know, they're looking at me, I'm looking at them. <laughs> and then I kind of got mad, you know, and I said, okay, you brought me here, creator. So if you want me to be a look, just a total fool in front of these foreign people, I will stand here and do that. Well, that was the wrong thing to say. <laughs> Whoosh. Whoosh just came in like a flood. I talked, <clears throat> I talked for two hours. I don't even know what I was saying, <laughs> but it was like, Whoa. and I, every once in a while, I would look down at somebody, you know, in the audience and I would see like they were, the eyes, you know, they were under the ether, man. I mean, I had them, 400 people. They were like, Whoa. like that. they didn't move, you know, they were hardly, they, the breath was shallow, the whole thing, man. Alpha waves, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> but if you want to serve, you will be tested. At one point, I, I was in my journey, I was invited to the Continental Indigenous Council in Standing Rock, South Dakota. This was an event sponsored by the Baha'is of the United States. This gathering had native spiritual people from over 300 indigenous nations. I met people from Australia and the South Pacific and over to Greenland and of course everything in between. And I met people from above the Arctic Circle and way down into Mexico. Native people, indigenous people. <laughs> We could, we could be here all night if I was just to tell you the stories of just what happened in those five or six days. But we're going to get down to what fits the theme. There was a Hawaiian kahuna. This is a name for a, a holy person, a medicine person, 
Hawaiian indigenous, a man. And he said, one of the evening programs, he said, I'm going to teach the fire walk down by the river, down by the Missouri River, right there near uh, Standing Rock, where we were, or we were camping. So we, we went, and he had us gather dry wood. He made, it was kind of a sandy beach on the side of the, uh, on the side of the river. And he made us, we made a, uh, like it was about this wide and about this long. And, and we stacked it up about this high with this wood. And he set it on fire and he's tending this fire and it's burning down to coals. Now here's the weird thing about this, guys. I'm not even gonna tell you about the fire walk. You'll have to find me and invite me somewhere else to hear about that. Cause that, but he had us prepare for the fire walk for two and a half hours. He had us do different things. And I'm not even going to tell you about all the different things he had us do, because we don't have time tonight. But I'm going to tell you about one of the things that he had us do. And that was, he said, go out. Now, it was dark by this time. We started, it was right at sunset. The fire's burning out. He had us go out alone into the prairie. Get away from everybody. By this time it was dark, there's, man, and he just said, just, just look at the sky and, and just open your mind, open your heart, meditate, you know, not a lot of guidance. So I'm looking, you can see every star, you know, you can see the Milky Way, and I'm just looking at that, and I'm just not thinking about anything, because, you know, I mean, he, did, he put the bar pretty low, like, didn't really have to come up with anything, or just like, just, just do it. And I'm like, oh, I like this. And I'm standing there. And after a minute or two, all of a sudden, down from the sky, there's this wire with a bare light bulb hanging on. A bright, bare light bulb. Not quite as bright as these lights, but almost. And I'm like, that's weird. And I'm looking at that. And then I look down where the light is, and I see behind that light, there's a line of people lined up, a long line, a very long line. And then I, I look in detail at the people, and I say, well, I know some of those people. Well, the truth was, I knew them all. Some of them I had known for a long time, some members of family, in-laws, etc., and some were people I had met once. But I thought, what did these people have in common? And then it hit me. It's not flattering. I had a resentment against every one of those people in that line. I was carrying resentment, or more than one in some cases. That was very sobering. So then, what do I do? Bring them under the light, one by one. So, went to the front of the line, got the first one, so under the light. Now, oh, when I saw them in that new light, could forgive them. Just that easy. So I was like, Phew, yeah, you were dealing with stuff too, this is a whatever. Boom, next, <laughs> you know, next. It took a while. It took a while. It took too long, really. Again, it's not flattering, but I did it. And I got through the whole line, and I thought, wow, I feel lighter, I feel better. Okay, so this one's over, right? The bulb still, the light's still hanging there. Well, no, I don't see there's nobody else. No, there's one more. No, there's nobody. It's dark out here, but I can see. No, there's one more. Me. I had to go under the light to, to 
forgive myself for all that <laughs> funkiness for all those years. And I did. Now, why am I telling this story? Because if we're going to serve, we have to work on ourselves. How are you going to help other people if you can't help yourself? How are you going to help other people if you can't, if you're carrying all this baggage? How are you going to help other people and serve if you can't change? At that same event, I uh, was invited to a friend, Kevin Locke, to his home, which was nearby where we were camping there and on the um, near Mobridge, South Dakota. And uh, there was a lot of people in the house and it was noise and everything. And I, I couldn't handle that for very long. So I went on the back porch and sat. And there was an elder woman who I later found out was his mom, Patricia Locke. And she was finishing, putting the finishing touches on a shade, a shade house. And I asked her about that and she said, oh yeah, there's a ceremony tomorrow. We're, we're adopting this lady, this white lady judge into our family. And I said, oh, well, can I help you? She said, no, you just mess it up. <laughs> Probably true. She said, you know what would help me if you just sit here and talk to me while I'm doing this work, and then I, it helps me kind of just enjoy the work. And I said, sure, I can do that. So she said, she asked me a question you very, that I hadn't heard before in Indian country that didn't get, you know, this is not that important to people, but she asked me this question. She says, well, what do you do? I was a little surprised, you know. Like, not who are you, what do you do? So I was like, uh, well, my wife and I have consulting business. We do training and consulting in Florida for nursing homes, because that's what we were doing at that time. And she goes, oh, nursing homes. She says, tell me something. Why do people put their elders in nursing homes and then they never go and visit them? And I'm like, oh boy, I'm on the spot, you know. So I thought, well, I'll give the standard industry answer, right? So I said, well, you know, uh, they feel guilty that they had to do that sometimes, that they couldn't take care of them. They, 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 they get busy and they forget. She's like, no, 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 that's not it. <laughs> that's not it. She said, the reason that people put their elders in nursing homes and don't go visit them is because... When they were children, their parents didn't know now how to nurture them. So now they don't know how to nurture their parents. A year or two later, Back in Florida, again, the story, doing the storytelling, and uh, at the, the the ceremonial circle, and this particular time for this particular month, I had gotten it like a week before, which was you know I could kind of relax because like I know it was tell these three stories, tell them in this order, bim bam boom done. And the last story was that one I just told you, okay? About the nursing homes and, okay? So I show up early to the ceremony because it was out in the middle of the woods in this natural uh, opening in the trees in the woods. And so you had to get there before it got dark or you get lost in the woods. Uh, and I show up early and, and uh, three black feathers, the, the leader, he's, he's there and he says, how you doing today, right? I said, good, good. How are you? And he says, good. He, I, I said, uh, he says, you got a story for us tonight? I said, oh, I have three. Now, I, I remember this. It was a Thursday night. So it was a school night. And he goes, and this had never happened before. He goes, three? I'm like, yeah. He says, you know, 
it's a, it's a school night, and we, I, I mean, we're expecting to have a lot of kids here tonight. And um, maybe you think we could, you know, we don't want to go too late. Maybe you think we could cut it short or something? And I'm like, and I didn't say anything. I turned and walked into the woods. <laughs> I don't know what to do. That never happened before. I found a stump to sit down on, and I said, Creator, what am I going to do now? I mean, I don't want to come off like a diva. Well, I mean, you know, I got to tell all my story. I'm not telling any. <laughs> you know, because I was caring about how people saw me, you know, how pe what people thought of me. Can't do that. But anyway, I did. I was. So after I, I put it to the creator and I put all my little complaints and everything, and then I listened. Tell all three stories in the order given or none. Okay. So I go back in and I'm still concerned about how Three Black Feathers is going to see me. And I'm like, well, you know, his name was Terry. And I said, Terry, you know, like how, how it works. I get the inspiration and everything and, and th this. And he's like, what? And I'm like, look, it's all three stories for nothing. <laughs> and he goes, oh, OK. I'm sorry. Never mind. Tell all three stories. OK. So. Storytelling time came, told the first story, told the second story, told the third story, right? Remember the story, right? Done. Second half of the ceremony, ceremony's over. People come up to me. This Cherokee woman named uh, Mary Two Hawks, she comes up to me. She was a nurse. She had always worked in hospitals. She comes up to me and she says, and she had her mom with her. And she says, she takes my hand. She says, Mike, I want to tell you, I really enjoyed the story tonight. And I'm like, oh, good, Mary, thank you. And I'm like, and she wouldn't let go. And she's like, no, no, I really, she's holding my hand. She won't let it go. She's like, no, I really, really enjoyed the stories tonight. I said, good. <laughs> Okay, she, and I'm trying to get my hand. She says, no, you don't understand. I really enjoy it, especially that third story. I said, Mary, I think you have a story to tell me. She said, yeah, I do. She said, you know, I've worked in hospitals my whole career, but lately I've been getting guidance from Creator that I need to change, that I need to take care of elders. We don't have anybody else in the nursing homes. And I've actually even started looking for jobs in nursing homes. But I'm not, I wasn't really sure that's what I should be doing. So I was, tonight we were getting ready for the ceremony, and I was asking my mom what she thought. You know, what, what did she think about that? What was her advice? And when I asked her that, and then she goes like this, she gestures to her mom. My mom said, and her mom says, Go to the ceremony, you'll get your answer. Go to the ceremony, you'll get your answer. So I really appreciate the stories tonight. And that's when I learned it's not about me. So if you want to serve, you gotta understand it's not about you. Okay, so that's <laughs> that's some of the life and stories. One aspect of the mystery, I think I've already told you. Pray, ask a question. Meditate, listen, and then trust <laughs> and enact what you're given. 
as I said, that was the only way I knew to do, do storytelling because that's how it was given. But a funny thing happened on the way to doing this. It was, it was just that one little area of my life is like, okay, this is one area where I just I have to let go because it's the only way I know how to do it. And I have to totally trust the creator, total trust in the guidance, period. But a weird thing happened. It started little by little and overflowed into my whole life to where that's how I live my life now. It's not always easy. It's not always easy. It's embarrassing sometimes. <laughs> The other mystery that I don't have time to get into tonight, unless maybe somebody asks a question about it, is the mystery of this land. Why is it, why is it the land of mystery? Because there's a lot. You know, we indigenous people have been here 30,000, 50,000 years or more. Yeah. Now I know all the anthropologists, 10,000, 13,000. Now they're finding more. No, we knew. We've been here longer than that. Okay, sorry. They'll find out. They'll catch up eventually. Okay? We learned some stuff. And you know what? We haven't told it to all of you yet because we don't trust you. Okay? Because you're going to try to make money off of it maybe or something. Okay? I'm probably even going to get kicked out for even telling you this much. <laughs> all right. But yeah, the mystery that I'm living is this, what I told you. Ask the question, listen, trust, and then do it, and act it. Act it out. And if, you're, and if you start acting it out and then something good changes, whatever, stop, pray again, do, it, do the process again. It's a very mysterious way to live, but it's a pretty cool way to live. And it sure beats the heck out of figuring things out. Now, I'm not saying I don't use my mind. I use my mind. I use my intellect. But we need more than that in this life. We need to understand our direction. Okay. I want to thank you for listening. Um, I want to tell you that if you want to hear some more of my stories, I have some, my wife and I are going to have some CDs for sale over here. You can come and uh, we have... Like, I think they're 10 bucks each cash. And then Miguel said, he, he, if you need to charge it, he has a way for us to do that. And if not that, we've got some little pieces of paper. You can order it online, too. It's a little more online. It's like $12 in postage, I think. Also, uh, before we have questions, I'm going to ask you uh, to stay seated where you are. Miguel is also going to do a closing blessing after the questions. So don't leave until you get to experience that. Okay. So we're, we're, we're looking for the question line there. Do we have any questions coming in to the question line? I'm going to take that opportunity to have another drink. Yes, sir. You're welcome. My name is Writing Bear. Hi, Jesus. Wow, that's a big question. Um, I'm going to answer your question with a story. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> when, I was, uh, when I was an undergraduate, huh? Oh, repeat his question. He said, how can we address environmental concerns? And 
and, and, and spread that understanding and knowledge? Did I get the gist of that? The indigenous perspective, right, okay, perfect. My story is gonna work. <laughs> okay, so how can we share that indigenous perspective? When I was an undergraduate at University of Texas, I took a class, I was in an honors program there, so I got to design my own curriculum. And so I got to take a variety of things because I was interested in everything. And in this honors program, one of the things I got to do was take an environmental biology class, but with one of the top professors. He didn't even look at undergraduates except for this one course. And this was a guy who helped develop the birth control pill. He had two whole um, floors on a huge building of labs at University of Texas, okay? So this guy was a heavy hitter and a great teacher. He loved what he was doing, he was talking about, and it was environmental biology. So I would always stay after class, you know, because I was into it. And so gradually I got to know him and I introduced him to our perspectives, some of our perspectives. I'd write on the board and make diagrams and stuff. And one day, it's like I could tell he was getting it. And I said, you know, yes, we need the science, but we need the science needs to be guided by a story, by an understanding, by meaning. And I had put this whole diagram on the board, and he's and he's look, he just looks at that diagram I had put for five minutes, and he's silent. And he said to me, I'll never forget it. He said to me, I really want to think like you do but all I can do is work in my lab. And when he said that, my blood ran cold because I thought, oh, these are the people who are gonna save us, you know? And they didn't, and they aren't. Yes, we do need that knowledge, but it needs to be guided by this perspective. I can only answer for myself. I do this everywhere I can. I do this, and I have, I have spoken to environmental groups, and, <laughs> and, and one, I, I was the, I was the a, a speaker for the, uh, what's the name of it? That, they had their meeting in Tucson, and, and I didn't know what I was going to say, and it was a good thing I didn't know, because I probably wouldn't have gone. I stood up there and read those guys the riot act. And I told them that story too. And you know what? There wasn't a sound in that place. I don't know. I did what I was supposed to do that day. I, 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 the theme of my talk to them was listen to other voices. And I did it all with stories. You know? Because I said, you know, I, when I was a young man, I thought you guys were going to do it. I thought you were going to figure it out. And you were going to save us. And you didn't. Working in your lab. You know, so we need more than that. We, it needs to be guided. I, but the bigger question, you know, I just think if everybody does what they can and, and speaks their truth. So, great question. Thank you. Uh, everybody, we have some uh, uh, signs with QR codes there. Uh, it can be easier to um, open your camera there and, and capture that and, and type in some questions. And we can take them that way and, and keep the distancing up. Um, but we can start off with the one uh, I thought of when, while Mike was talking. Are there any storytellers that you particularly enjoy or admire as a listener? Ooh. Uh, well, of course, my grandmother. Um, it wasn't, you know, I did, at the time, though, when I was a kid, I didn't think about the storytelling. It was just the kind of person she was, her being. She was a person who was the same with everybody she met. And I'll tell you what I mean. <laughs> this was like in the 1950s. We went on a tour, we went to Washington, DC. We went, we toured the White House. And I went down the wrong hallway or something, and, and this real tall, bald man found me, and, and my grandma was coming. This was President Eisenhower. And I remember he he you know he bent down on and, you know, a kid, as a kid, I was very sensitive. You're sensitive to the things like the voice tone of adults. She was talking to the president, which she knew who it was, even if I didn't. I was like four or five years old. And her voice tone didn't change. When she talked to the custodian or whatever, her voice tone didn't change. 
She was talking the same way to everyone. Now, why is that important? Because I respected her because of that. Because a lot of the adults, you see them, boy, you know, they see somebody with, that's up from them, boy, the whole, it all changes. You can hear it, and kids can hear it. You're not fooling your kids, by the way. They hear it. Even if it's not conscious, they know. So I knew, I knew that what she was, the story she was telling me, that everything she said to me was important because of the kind of person she was. I have been blessed. I had so many mentors. I have been so blessed. I've gotten to meet so many Native elders, and they've spent hours with me. They spent hours with me. Not just Cherokee, different tribes, different nations. And I listened to their stories. Um, I'm, I'm just afraid to get into it because, I mean, you know, people need to get their sleep and stuff. I'm afraid, like, this is why I made my little guide sheets because I, I can go off, you know, I can. The, 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 it reminds me of, a, it reminds me of a, uh, this friend of mine. This, actually, he's a Navajo medicine man, and uh, he, uh, he told me this story about there was this guy who uh, was raised off of the res. He was raised in like Los Angeles or something. And he had really long hair. Anyway, this Navajo guy, and he came back home, you know, and then boy, he was just like a talker. He knew everything and, and he ran for council and he did all these things. And, you know, he would, if people would gather in, he would talk. And he would go on and on and on and on and on. And people are just like, oh, you know. And finally, the, my, my friend said he got a name for himself. And his name was, he whose talk is as long as his hair. <laughs> and so I don't want to get a name for myself, but maybe it's too late. I don't know. Anyway, OK. I had another one. Like, um, obviously, yeah. technology allows us to record and capture video and audio. We're doing yes. that tonight. You have Great. a CD of stored. Yes. Um, and in the last 18 months, we've been living with technology connected remotely. But how important is it for the listener and the storyteller to be connected in the same time and place like tonight? That's a great question. Um, I don't know if I'm going to answer it directly, but I, I have the past year and a half, I have been still asked to do storytelling and I've done it virtually. Now, the cool thing about it is, is I didn't have to wear a mask. And I told them tonight, I can't do this with a mask. And I think you guys can see why, right? It's like, it just wouldn't work. I'm sorry. Cause there's more to it, you know, than just the words. Um, but I have done it a lot now virtually, uh, in, in, in real time, not in the same place, but yet, and I did ask, I do ask too, when I do it, I ask if as many of you can, if you can have your camera on, cause I need that feedback. The storyteller needs that feedback. Uh, you need to know, you know, how, how well you're reaching your audience or if you know, your talk is as long as your hair and then shut up. Um, <clears throat> so, it surprised me. If you had told me that, I would say, no, nah, yeah, it'll never work. But I was like, I didn't want to disappoint. I said, I've got to try it. And I prayed about it. And creator said, try it. So I tried it. And it's, it's you know, you miss some things for sure. You miss some things. But, um, and then I know some people have, have taken video and I've given permission for them to do that and, and use that. And for example, all my all the, the tracks on my CD are from live performances. So you know the people they can kind of put themselves in the in the face in the in the place rather of the audience. Uh, so I think that helps. You know, th there's that live interaction feeling and the reactions and so forth. Uh, but you know the gestures and all that. Uh, so I would say my answer would be to a surprising extent, it can work. And, and I am glad I kept an open mind about that. Uh, of course, this is a lot more fun for me. You know, this is a lot more fun. But uh, 
my physician daughter has told me that I have to be careful uh, because if I am foolish and die, she's going to kill me. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, we have one submitted uh, from the audience. Can you tell us your favorite story on the oneness of humanity? Oh, yeah. That's a great question. <clears throat> I guess one of my favorite stories on that topic is a Cherokee story called Poisonous Snakes. There was these two Cherokee brothers, and they, uh, they were very close. They lived in a cabin out in the woods, and they, you know, they hunted, and they, they, they lived off the land and so forth. And uh, so one day, one brother says, you know, I'm going to go hunting. So he went off, and the other brother said, I've got things to do here around the house. I'll stay here. So nightfall came. The other brother was still not back from hunting. Well, his brother at home, he thought, you know, maybe he got a big deer. He couldn't carry it all the way back. He's camping for the night. I'm not going to worry about it. So he went to sleep. Next morning, still no sign of his brother. Sun gets up, still no sign. Now he's starting to get a little worried. So he goes down the trails where he knows his brother usually hunts. And sure enough, he sees his brother lying on the side of the trail face down. And he goes up and he checks and, he, and of course he's dead. And when he checks him, he sees he's been bitten by a poisonous snake. And he's stricken with grief. We say his heart became dark because the way he tried to handle his grief at the loss, the, the tragic loss of his brother, was with hatred and the desire for revenge. And so from that day, he made it his life's mission to attack, to go after any snake he saw. He was indiscriminate. He didn't care. They're all the same. He didn't even care if it was poisonous or not. And he just basically destroyed himself with this obsession of killing every snake he could and even going and looking for snakes to kill. So now, going back to science and ecology, what do we know from modern science about and biology about snakes. First of all, if you take the whole snake population of the whole world, science tells us, all the snakes, poisonous, non venomous all the species, all kinds, if you take that whole population, about 2% are poisonous. 2%. And of course, those snakes perform a valuable function in terms of keeping down the vermin and keeping people from starving, having their food eaten by rats and so forth and so on. And even the poisonous snakes, they need their poison, you know, for, for certain reasons too. But so this is how we use these kind of things to teach our children. Because, you know, this is the way some people are. Way back when sometime, some person from this group did something to somebody from that group in your family. And now, oh, we know about those people. We know and we don't trust them. And maybe even we hate them. And maybe even we kill them every chance we get. But is that in line with reality? No. Yeah, there's bad people. There's people who are up to no good. Maybe about 2%. Maybe about 2%, say. So this is how. This is how we like to show these things. But uh, if I was telling it to a child, I wouldn't explain it. I'd make them think about it. That's more fun. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Um, thank you for your stories. Uh, I just had a question. As the world gets more modern and distracted, 
by technology and other things like that, what is the theme you have for keeping our traditions and remembering who we are? What was the last part again? What, what, what is the... What is the theme you have for keeping our traditions and remembering who we are? Hmm. You know, we had technology here. I'm getting into the land of mystery now. We had technology here. It was just a different kind of technology. You know, people you say, well, you know, these Native Americans, they were so smart. Why didn't they invent the wheel? Look at North America. You know, we didn't have draft animals. And then they found, they found in, the, in the Aztec things, they found little toys, toy cars with wheels. So, yeah, we knew about the wheel. It just wasn't useful for us. But we had other technologies. We had psychological technology. You know, think about this. If you could somehow understand how to put your consciousness into an animal, for example, let's say a bird, and then you could direct that bird to fly off in different directions and find where the game was before you went walking <laughs> to wore yourself out walking this way and that way. And that. Wow, wouldn't that be great? Hmm. for example. So technology is not enough. Technology is just a way to do something. Our traditions and the stories tell us what it is we should do. <laughs> That's what we need. We've got to know what to do. We've got to know what to do. And the other thing is, even tradition is not always completely reliable because things change. Then what do we do? We have to look to the Creator again for a different message, maybe, you know, for a different way that fits with modern times, you know, and modern conditions. So I, I just want to say this young lady, if can I say your name? She interviewed me, Alina. She interviewed me virtually for the Bare Essential News. I've been interviewed on TV, radio, for newspapers. Best interview I've ever had. She was prepared. She asked intelligent questions. She listened and asked smart follow-up questions. We ended up talking, I don't know, an hour or so, right? So... You're special. I just want to say that. It's true. So if we know it, if we know it, we have to share it, you know? And we have to find our way. We each have to find our way. You know, there was a time when I was young, I wanted to be president of the United States. I thought that was the way. When I was six years old, I made my aunt take me down to the Democrat Party headquarters in East Ridge, Tennessee, and I got all this material, Kennedy for president. And I went door to door knocking on people's door. Hey, I vote for Kennedy for president in Chattanooga, Tennessee. <laughs> and I got some door slamming in my face too. I didn't care. But that wasn't my way, I found out. I found out. That wasn't, that wasn't the way for me. So, sweetie, you got, everybody's got to find their way. I don't know. <laughs> but I know, I know if you, we are responsible for what we know. And if we do our best to live up to that responsibility in using our gifts and talents, like the rabbit and bear, right? the things the Creator give, give, gave to us to, as an individual. And then maybe we try to find some other people who try and do the same thing.
Great question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm f oh, one more? Okay. Mm. You're welcome. Thank you for that. Um, and you mentioned seventh generation too. These young people coming out, I, I feel more hopeful than I've ever felt. <laughs> yeah, that guy's crazy. <laughs> that sealed it. If you didn't know before, now you know. I'm more hopeful than I've ever been. Because things aren't really worse. They're not worse now. We're just all seeing the, the veils are being ripped off, and we're seeing. It's always been there. But that's in a chance to do what? To change. To move beyond. So I, and, and then the other thing, th this generation of young people that are coming now, they're really different. They scare me in a good way. <laughs> they're, they're really, they've got something. So we're blessed. And our elders talked about this 10, 20,000 years ago. They saw all of this. So that's the other reason. That's another one of the mysteries. But no time for that tonight. My uh, talk is now probably a little longer than my hair. Yep. So guys, I want to thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you for your questions. And uh, I'll turn it over to my good brother, Miguel, for the closing. Thank you for your medicine that you shared with us today. Because again, it's important to tell these stories. It's a way of our life, a way of our traditions, and cultural teaching. So I offer you this medicine bundle for your teaching. Oh, thank you, brother. Thank you. Again, uh, I thank you Man, I hope and thank you. Oh. 
Yes. Mr. Lander, would you be willing to share the limits of your time 